welcome to Ideas of India, where we examine academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan and I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Today, my guest is Aditya Balasubramanian, who is a senior lecturer in history at Australian National University. His research focuses on various aspects of history of modern South Asia and he's the author of the new book, Toward a Free Economy, Swatantrata and Opposition Politics in Democratic India. We spoke about the history of a conservative and ideological opposition politics in India, the influence of B.R. Shinoy and more generally the Austrian economists on the Swatantra party players in India, about C. Rajgopalachari, other members and much more. For a full transcript of this conversation, including helpful links of all the references mentioned, click the link in the show notes or visit mercators.org slash podcasts. Aditya, thank you so much for doing this. This is such a pleasure. Welcome to the show. Well, no, the pleasure is all mine, Shruti. It's so nice to be able to be a part of the Ideas of India podcast, which I've enjoyed listening to. And it's great to get an opportunity to talk about the book. So thank you. Yeah, you know, the book actually surprised me. When I started reading it, I thought it's, you know, sort of a history of economic thought since 1950 until the emergency or, you know, something like that. That was my prior. But the book is actually more, I think, a political history of India at the time. And what you do is quite interesting. You sort of subvert the genre, right? It's not through the lens of the victor, but through the lens of opposition politics. I mean, it plays out through a critique of centralization and planning, you know, the way it is conducted by the, you know, ruling party. And maybe I'm drawing too much of a parallel to, you know, present day. The big themes that for me emerged from the book was that one, even a conservative opposition can be ideological and it can be principled, right, which is sort of missing Uh, oftentimes in modern day politics. The second, that opposition efforts at building a wider coalition against centralization is sort of not a new thing. It's inherent in Indian polity. We're just seeing the newest iteration of it in modern day politics. And you've presented something from the past. And uh, the third important theme is that Indian conservatives also believed quite strongly in pluralism and minority rights and constitutional protections, right? So in some sense, you are actually demolishing the idea of what Indian conservatism looks like when I look at it through the modern day lens. So am I drawing too much of a connection in trying to think through these broad themes that emerge from the book or was that, you know, what you intended? Well, no, I think you actually stated some of the things I'm trying to argue uh, more forcefully than I was able to. I think there are a couple of things. The first is that this conservative politics is one that has a very strong influence of the nationalist movement and one of Gandhianism, right? And so there is a idea about unity in diversity that matters a lot to them. And that is something that you see in a figure like Raj Gopalachari, you see in a figure like Minu Masani. There are also elements who are not so minded in that way, like A.M. Munshi. But if you look at the platform of the party and its activities, and even the difficulties that it has in forming coalitions in when it tries to form coalitions in the Hindi belt, you see it's because it's not quite willing to compromise on those kinds of principles of broadly, we kind of focus on the economic issues And we're not invested very much in the issues regarding religious conservatism. Now, of course, there are concerns or considerations with respect to the way in which their ideas about capital accumulation end up reproducing certain kind of caste hierarchies. And you see that, especially in the Charotar Party Dats, right? But this is a distinct phenomenon, right, from the Hindu nationalism that you see today. And I think that's very important uh, in terms of understanding Indian politics of where we've come from, where we are and where we're perhaps going. Yeah. And in fact, the idea that conservatism was 
built into pluralism because that's sort of how india has chugged along for millennia right everyone has sort of chugged along together slowly in what is this highly multilinguistic multicultural multiclass multireligious project and the radical thing to do it would be to subvert it right the conservative thing to do it is to sort of find a way to keep that pluralism going alongside in a way that you can you can sort of push at the margins towards you know different kinds of agenda people may have whether it is women's rights for annihilating some very severe forms of caste oppression i know they didn't believe in caste annihilation altogether and you know so on so that's sort of how i read that project when you talked about the political movement advocating for freer markets one of the arguments that you make is that it doesn't always have to be anti democratic right so to me that felt a little bit surprising because you know i mean at one sense like you know if i think about this from the hayekian perspective you can't really have political freedom without economic freedom right that's one of the core tenets of uh, you know hayekian classical liberal thought so in that sense you know it's not odd to me at all that people who advocate for freer markets people who advocate for strong constitutional protections of property rights and minority rights and so on uh, it sort of goes hand in hand with democracy so that's one part of it but the other reason i thought that's not very surprising to me is because in india unlike other places the socialist model was democratic it's this kind of fabian gradualist socialism that needs to be pursued not just through top down plans but also part of it is democratic legislation right even within the central planning and sometimes they're at odds with each other and you know like john mathias famously resigns uh, because the socialism is sort of cannibalizing the the democratic elements and so on but given that the socialism is democratic is it so surprising that the opposition or you know the advocating of markets also democratic like are we bringing too much of a cold war lens or a post soviet collapse lens into this so to speak yeah i think there are a couple of things if you were to look at the scholarship on neoliberalism right uh, and again i don't know i don't know that i would necessarily call my actors neoliberals i think they are in conversation with neoliberals and and we can talk about this later they are able to appropriate some of the language of neoliberalism and that's significant but some of their fundamental precepts tenets etc are quite distinct from something like you know methodological individualism or even kind of international free trade for many of them etc right but one of the things but it's significant that when you take some of this scholars which is interested in i think powerfully and with some reason in the question of encasement from market forces i think what my work tries to offer is a perspective from the southern hemisphere which shows there's no actually if you think about this from the perspective of the south asian context your you know poor runners or you know the mid 20th century folks who are arguing for free markets are not your technocrats sitting in you know sunset bhavan or wherever they are and they're not kind of working through IMF world bank kind of packages nor are they intellectuals sitting in the academy but rather these are informal economic thinkers who think that the free markets are part of the fabric of democratic life right and i think that it is in a sense in response to some of those characterizations right but you're absolutely right i mean if you were to look at hayek uh, constitution of liberty the use of information society you know the soft term his perspective is more nuanced than what that some of that holds but there is you know in in certain others a anti democratic kind of bent which i think you know some of the scholars should had when you say anti democratic do you mean technocratic because that's part of it right so the, is the anti democratic coming from imf conditionalities and things that happen much later in the latin american countries in the east asian economies is that where the anti democratic comes from because i honestly otherwise don't see too many people advocating for both simultaneously sure sure, sure. yeah i think you have to right i mean some of that is a retrospective projection from the you know 70s onwards and that's something that amy has kind of amy often has kind of argued in her book sorting out the mixed economy but there are i think for example in certain kinds of you know thinkers from the austrian school right and again you know about this much better than i do my understanding is that there are certain people who are you know skeptical of some of the possibilities of democracy but we can i mean we can kind of talk more about that and and i think that's something that the scholarship has kind of run with i don't necessarily have a 
you know a stake or a particular uh, set of you know concerns around that but the way in which i was trying to characterize this is actually well let's try to examine this not so much as what is the ideal market design rather than and how should experts kind of you know, work through it or maybe even get it passed through certain kind of legislative processes but if we are to take your informal figures whose whole kind of you know raison d'etre in certain way is publicity the press electoral politics etc what then can we say about these sorts of people and you say that it's actually a profoundly democratic kind of thing uh, but it may not necessarily be progressive in the same way that and i when i say that i don't mean that it's regressive but i mean that if we look very contextually right there are a lot of people who will look at the swatantra figures and look at them as as liberals right i think in an absolute sense that's true but if we're looking at where are they relative to all of the other people and what they're saying in the indian political spectrum right even though they are arguing in a sense for a kind of capitalist uh, form of development which is you know, quite a different from the status quo it's in that perspective i mean i'd be more curious to continue the conversation on the austrians and their reservations later but before that i have you know n- normally i have noticed that whenever the term neo liberalism is used it's on average it is with a kind of sort of sneering hostility if i may say yeah. that but sure, you sure. don't use it that way through the book at all but you know yeah. i i would first ask you how you define it and i mainly ask this because economists don't use the word neoliberal within the economics tradition i've you know usually read only historians or political scientists describe it and my trouble with the word is that you know it's sort of it's been used to describe everything from privatization efforts in poland in the 90s to the iraq war to university endowments to swatantra party politics you know in in this case in your book i'm unable to grasp what it means so maybe you can help us define it you know especially in the context of the book and then we can go from there yeah absolutely yeah no again i mean i don't I, i think that one of the things that i'm very interested in is product of using this term responsibly right and uh, historically for historical fashion because otherwise for a lot of people neoliberalism means everything you don't like since 1980 and it can be used in a manner of speaking that it's sort of conflated with so many other things right and i think what some of the best scholars have shown is you know a lot of the stuff that you don't like about 1980 since 1980 is actually stuff that existed since 1950 <laughs> you know and there are certain kinds of things with respect to the operation of capital that can be troubling right which is which is fine which are, you know so the way that i kind of think about it is in a kind of intellectual historical sense in terms of the a terminology that is used but is then later i suppose embraced with certain kind of ambiguity by hayek in his essay a rebirth of liberalism and i think he even chose used it earlier in a sense reinventing liberalism after the advent of keynesianism right and then also the milton friedman essay neoliberalism and its prospects right and now there are various different definitions of like you know what are the elementary aspects of that etc i think quince labordian has given a fair kind of picture of what exactly uh, some of the constitutive visions of that project are from the austrian school right he talks about prices he talks about signals he talks about you know various sorts of things and that's kind of what i i work with in that sense but again what i'm trying to show is that it's disingenuous right to look at swatantra party as neoliberals but what's interesting is that given that montpellerin society some of its progenitors like hayek and friedman have at points used this terminology it is significant that their indian interlocutors are these four that's kind of the way in which i'm i'm thinking about this yeah, yeah in that case i guess we're uh, closer than i had imagined because i would call that classical liberal because montparnasse society members you know I, i i like to use the terms people use for themselves right i may not agree with communism but if someone says they're communist i believe them when they say they're communist i would call them a communist so it's the same way with liberals if someone says they're classical liberal i would tend to you know go with that terminology so yeah i mean then i guess i i i think we're a lot closer in the sense i would call this a bigger classical liberal influence but of course post war classical liberalism is a little bit different than you know it's 19th century century version or its 18th century variant as adam smith described it and that's fair enough but just this may be to the listeners it sounds like quibble over words but you know most economists wouldn't necessarily call that neoliberalism 
No, I think it's an important. I mean, it's an intellectual conversation. Our uh, intellectual history and our, our our words are 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 very important, right? And so I think that's quite interesting because, for example, you know, some of my friends at the Center for Civil Society in Delhi, right, consider their project to be a classical liberal one, right? Path Shah and others, including you know, a friend of mine who you know, reviewed this book, Sanjeev Kashyap, who's been associated with them. Now, I think that in an absolute sense, that's that's accurate. But I guess what I'm thinking about, you know, 1950s India. right and the context of everybody else in india it's a question about what relationally are they to those people when even your bharatiya janasangh is saying that we are a kind of socialist so if you are everybody else is socialist and you say they are liberal then relationally you are conservative right so that's kind of the question but you are absolutely right you know, i think one of the one of the discussions that i had about this book there was a question of why are you using conservative for them when what they're adv- advocating for is a capitalist economy moving from a society that in many parts is still feudal and in that sense that's a very radical kind of thing right so i think with terminology you have to make certain choices and this was the one that i made because of the relational perspective but if you were to think about the absolute kind of a temporal perspective i think you're absolutely right to say that you know there is a, a classical liberal or even in certain sense libertarian kind of impulse yeah. right and and you know here i mean maybe actually this discussion is useful especially for the younger students who are working in this area i think one important distinction is uh, when we read things in the popular press especially in the english language press uh, you know letters that are exchanged with people abroad versus say academic papers which appear in particular journals and you know uh, discussions that happen at conference meetings of particular disciplines and so on the way i think about the differences for instance you know you you've talked about how b r shinoy uh, went to the mont pelerin society and you know sort of he was a big hit and he was uh, celebrated as this very important probably the only free market e- economist between athens and tokyo or something like that i think i remember peter bau saying you know, some phrase like that right but at the meeting he's talking about east and west germany but that you know today if i were to speak about pluralism at an in an international setting i might start with what's happening in ukraine or what's happening with israel and palestine but that doesn't mean that my pluralism is informed by that it probably just means i'm contextualizing you know what i'm talking about in india with respect to what's happening in the rest of the world for a particular kind of audience whereas when you read b r shinoy writing journal articles right it is not written in that cold war setting necessarily he's really talking about like you know there's a much more direct line to be drawn between him and the austrian tradition when it comes to capital theory where he's talking about the relationship between prices of consumer goods versus prices of investment goods and you know this is stuff he's written in the 1930s this is way before the cold war and so on so i i think this is a a useful thing you know it also depends on what kind of material one taps into which we can get into when you talk about you know the a very broad range of archival work you've tapped into it's quite extraordinary actually the number of different languages the range of material but i think part of this also comes from the material itself right so this is english language press people talking at these foreign conferences it's happening in the heyday of cold war politics so it feels like that's another place where this terminology which is very internationally used in a particular context seeps in Yeah, I think that's right. At the same time, I think that with somebody, the figure like Shinoy, right, the stuff that he's writing in ninety. So, my I've written elsewhere about Shinoy, and I think Shinoy actually, my hypothesis is that he is there when Hayek is delivering prices in production, right? Uh, he's in the L- at the LSE Absolutely. when when Hayek is doing this. Yeah, I'm thirty thirty one, thirty two, if I'm not mistaken. And he works with you know Philip Barrett Whale, and he teaches takes a class with Theodore Gregory. So that that milieu certainly shapes him. Now I think one thing that is and even his professors in Hindu Banaras Hindu University one of them is a Austrian trained economist now one thing that is interesting though is that by the time he is delivering a piece like free uh, versus controlled economy and going to the Mont Pelerin society he has almost shifted from academic articles to newspaper articles he's moved to gujarat where he is director of social sciences he's no longer professor of economics or rbi economist right or you know he was in ceylon very involved with central banking there and actually interestingly shanoy is considered a kind of hero in in sri lanka today right so you know one of the people invited me to come to the advocata institute over there to speak so it's quite interesting in the report that he produces on ceylon my point is that by the time that he's writing in 
in journals and advising Swatantra Party associated with the movement of free economy. He's kind of shifted to more a public affairs commentator. Uh, in India, he's talking mainly about deficits, overspending, inflation, and profligacy. And yes, overseas, he is talking about, he's, you know, the Mont Pelerin Society. He's, he gives, I think, four papers to them over his career. And he is invested in more of a kind of Cold War binaries, as a matter of speaking. It's so hard for me to separate the the core Austrian from you know B.R. Shanoi because somehow I may I even in his later work it it comes through because he rarely uses you know the standard neoclassical equilibrium conceptions. He's like such a market process economist the way like you know he's really Hayekian in that sense that somehow when even when I read his popular stuff I'm able to parse that out but I guess I understand what you're saying that that may not be so obvious to someone who's not read his QJE articles or like his you know critique of uh, the the socialist plan and so on no no so, you know absolutely I, I think that's right but I, I I think that if you think about the way in which so there is certainly a theoretical base from which he's operating but the I think these the specifics and the nature of the genres of production of knowledge production for him shift over time. Absolutely. Right? No, that there is no question because, and it's clear. That's why I said that, you know, I characterize this more as a political history than history of economic thought because the most of the material that you're using is actually publicity material, right? This is very clearly sort of to propagate particular ideas about the economy, raise questions about price controls, about inflations, about this kind of overly centralized model. And a lot of it is political pamphlets, you know, not just, you know, libertarian material that is translated or adapted to the Indian context or so on. So, I, I think there I completely understand what you're saying. You know, in one sense, it's always useful to see the counter. So in the case of Swatantra Party, the counter is really the Congress, right? That's the the big one. And I mean, the communists on the other side, if you were to think about it. But it seems that the conversation is really Swatantra Party compared to whom? Well, compared to Congress, which happens to also be, you know, the ruling party. And this is a huge, uh, sort of enormous force in Indian politics. And at multiple points, I, I don't disagree with your categorization of the Swatantra Party as conservative, mainly because I think on social questions, they were quite conservative, right? So there's a question of social versus political versus economic life. And I think on e political and economic life, they are very classical liberal slash libertarian. But on social questions, they tend towards being quite conservative. And, and we can get into that. But relative to them, the way you've characterized the Congress is that they were progressive. And that somehow didn't quite fit right. And I'll tell you where I'm going with that. You know, in one sense, if we go back to, say, Rajni Kothari's idea of the Congress, he talks about how it's not one thing. In fact, even they don't know what they really are because there is a progressive faction. There is a deeply conservative faction. There is a feudal faction, right? There was initially uh, many of the native princes and monarchs used to fund and support the Congress and that eventually fell away. There is a very strong business big business faction that supports them. And so I would describe them from the point of view of the governing party as socialist, because that's the main, you know, economic plan that they're trying to propagate. But I was sort of curious about your description of Congress as progressive. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I guess the, the way that I have thought about it is, I don't know if yet I, I did, uh, but the thing is that after Patel dies, right, the balance of power in the Congress is shifted towards Nehru. And as Kaviraj Chabru is in a very famous essay, right, he essentially relies on the bureaucracy to implement policy in a progressive fashion around certain kinds of policy that he often passes through kind of executive fiat or, you know, having managed the numbers in legislature. Right. Because he can't, for example, on something like land reform, right, the balance of power in the Congress is such that he can't actually do very much. Right. So it is progressive in that sense, insofar as the Nehru dominated Congress is able to do pursue a certain set of policies with respect to uh, uh, you know, uh, price controls to try to keep prices at a particular level, whether or that that, that succeeds is a different story. Right. But this is the kind of impulse. And it's pretty much around the idea of Nehru as the kind of driving force of the party. Now, of course, as Kotari points out, there are many different factions vying for influence. There are clans that are thwarted, right? But at the same time, right, the progressive is limited in that. And so this kind of feeds into the fact that, you know, one of the characters is not actually a CIA agent, you know, Masani, because, you know, uh, 
the Nehru dismisses the communist government using Article 356 in 1959. And so there are kind of limits to that. I think one of the things that Francine Frankel says is that actually in a certain way, the Khrotantra party resembles in a certain fashion the various elements that comprise the Congress. And I think that's important in that when you think about the Swatantra party fizzling away in the 1970s, the feudal elements kind of go back into the Congress O. Yeah. No, for me, the reason that also sort of, you know, it just kind of st- stuck out to me, the progressive labeling of the Congress is, you know, later you get into the discussion of caste and women. And on these two fronts, Swatantra party politicians score particularly poorly, right, compared to the others. <laughs> But to me, the only people who really do well on that scorecard are the communists, especially the Kerala communists, right? Like not even communists in sort of the hinterland or Bengal. If we talk about, you know, even within the Congress, even though they have Hindu Succession Act and they're trying to modernize certain things and try to bring in progressive elements, once it comes to women, things just kind of come to a standstill, right? If I remember correctly, only Kerala passed the amendment to make women co Opasners in the Hindu Succession Act in the 70s. And, you know, the other states, which are, you know, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, all of them passed these amendments in the 80s and 90s. And I think of these five states, I think three or five are non-Congress. Even with there, I feel like in India, all political parties were socially conservative, just, you know, varying in degrees. And the only truly radical people are the communists. You know, in this front, they deserve a lot of, I, I guess, praise for setting out that agenda right at the beginning in the 50s. Yeah, I think at the same time, I would say that there is probably a little more space within the Congress. I mean, when you think about, you know, figures like, you know, Hansa Mehta and this sort of thing. And the Congress kind of women's committee in the, you know, and the, the National Planning Committee. In terms of the, the, the parallel that I was... Yeah, certainly yeah, there's better there's representation. Sort of, yeah, There's better representation. And I think that the other point is the kind of idiom with which figures like Leelavati Munshi and Gayatri Devi in the Swatantra party spoke, right? You know, to look at Nirmala Panerjee's classic article, Whatever Happened to the Dreams of Modernity, there was a slightly more liberatory valence to some of the visions that are being put forth in the Congress from the 30s. And I think that the leading women of the Sudhantra Party, of whom there were not very many, are very much invested in the whole, you know, we are householders, um, this matters to us because we buy the vegetables, that sort of thing. So I think that's the sort of change. But you're absolutely right. And I think You know, was anybody really that progressive at that time? Even the communists, right? So I think that's fair. And but my kind of humble submission is that I think there's a slight way in which the the Swatantra Party figures are, you know, invested in the you know, gender division of labor in a manner of speaking. Yeah, but you know, the way we also think about now, I'm thinking, I guess this is partly the disciplinary lens coming in again, right? When we think about progressive, you know. It, economic models, we're really thinking about welfare spending. And in that sense, modern day, both parties on the left and the right are able to have far greater welfare spending because they can raise more revenues, you know, post-liberalization, the economy has grown and so on, much more than those of the past. So in a, in a bizarre sense, if you think about welfare spending on women in particular, you know, Modi's BJP government would far surpass any kind of progressive agenda there of, you know, the old Congress governments. In fact, probably Manmohan Singh's 2004-2009 government probably does the best on that agenda, you know, you you know, setting out a new sort of progressive goal, so to speak. But that's where I feel like of the old Congress lot, I would just really call them socialists because they're tinkering with prices and they're tinkering with capital. They're not really trying to grow the size of the pie and then redistribute through non-distortionary ways, you know, through other instruments. They're really just relying on price controls, quantity controls, licenses, things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is, you know, when we think, go back to the Malnovis model and all of that, the import substituting industrialization framework, when we think of its aims and we think of what it achieved, and it's one of the things I described in the first chapter, and those are quite at odds with each other. But at the same time, and again, you know, obviously we can think about the counterfactual, but given the sort of menu set of 
choices the way people were thinking at the time. We do move from a kind of 0% growth rate to our whatever, you know, what Raj Krishna call our Hindu rate or whatever it is. I would say that, you know, in that respect, the, you know, the capacity for welfare service delivery based on the, you know, model of accumulation, right, is, you know, deficient maybe compared to what we have today. But relative to the sort of colonial growth trap, it's a change. And I think that was what I was trying to uh, to indicate. One other question I had was, you know, I really want to get to the bulk of the book, which is about the Swatantra Party politics. Now that, you know, some of these definitional, you know, quibbles are the way. When I read, say, you know, Rohit Day's book, to me, it's quite clear that a lot of the initial response to this kind of Indian statism or state control and interference in everyday life was the response was for regular people to claim their individual freedoms, right? And he writes about this. This is like, you know, butchers and prostitutes and, you know, cotton textile sellers basically petitioning the court and asking for, you know, protection of their individual freedoms, their right to trade, and so on. From that, it seems to me that there was a broader coalition to be formed, right, against this large status socialist planning machinery. But it seems like from your characterization, the Swatantra Party was very limited to a middle class sort of, you know, imagination, you know, where the enemy is just, you know, the Congress politician, bureaucrat or big businessman who is interfering with the middle class urban dweller in some sense, right? That broader coalition of butchers and prostitutes and bus transport operators and cotton sellers, that just kind of disappears. Do you think that was really their downfall or the roadblock in rising into this big coalition? So I think that's certainly part of it. But I guess I also have a slightly different reading of the Rohit Day argument, right? Which is that the Rohit Day argument is also, and again, this is maybe downplayed in some ways, right? Is also about the community forces that shape, you know, who, you know, the, the, the person who petitions and this sort of thing, right? So there's a certain pressure that comes from, from the group, right? As a sort of, you know, social formation. And secondly, there is a question about, which he doesn't really get into, which I suppose is getting into in his new project, is about the mediation by the lawyer, right? And that it's the lawyer who is essentially arguing this for the butcher or whatever, and using, in some sense, the language of individual rights and all of that. I think it's still an open question of, you know, to what extent is your your butcher or your Marwadi trader and whatnot conscious of, you know, or, or practicing individualism in that sense? And that is is one question. But I think you're absolutely right with respect to the fact that the Swatantra Party, unable to appeal to the, because I think that there is there are individual sentiments at broad base at this time, even if things are dominated by family, caste, etc. Right? You do have everybody's giving a vote that's them their own, right? And there is a there is a you know, compulsion to. Allow people to, I mean, even if you're, you know, paying people to vote based on caste or whatever it is, ultimately when they go on the ballot and they do, they pursue the vote, that's their choice, right? And I think that's something that Swarantra is not able to take advantage of. So where does this imagination of who is sort of their audience coming from? You describe what it is, but I was more curious, like, you know, now that you've gone over the archive so carefully... Are they somewhere explicitly or implicitly saying, okay, these are our kinds of people, those are not our kinds of people? That's the part that I couldn't, you know, quite grasp. Like, it's quite clear that they don't include it. But how are they going about that decision making as a political entity? Yeah, I think that's, I think they're also, they themselves are not particularly clear about that. I think this is part of the problem. So I think that in in the feudal areas, they're absolutely clear. Right. So the, the I mean, the, the contradiction is that ideologically, right, this is a party that is driven by landed mercantile communities transitioning to cap, you know, forms of capitalist accumulation, etc. But then the vote bank story is essentially about your former feudal landlords trying to convert those kinds of relationships into, you know, seats in the legislative assembly and parliament. Right. And so. How much does your appeal to a particular kind of middle class citizen and all of that actually help you in the ballot box at a very minor kind of level, right? Because I don't think they're very clear themselves about 
who that particular constituency it depends on who you ask in the party right minu masani's definition of middle class person is very different from ng ranga's definition is different from siraj gopalachari's uh, definition etc etc right you know but here there is something odd going on and in a sense you're right that swatantra party becomes like a mini congress umbrella party in itself right so you have ranga for instance who is strongly pro property rights but against feudalism right he's all about the ryotwari farmers but against uh, you know zamindari and is quite pro abolition of feudalism and zamindari in some sense and on the other extreme you have their most popular sort of political candidate who is direct descendant of the monarchy who is gayatri devi right and so how much of this is just coming from we are all against the congress so stitch the coalition together in that sense so that's one part of it so in one sense they seem m- much more you know principled but on the other hand the moment it goes into politics you have this bizarre coalition which in some sense i think almost dilutes the message compared to you know the communists or the socialists yeah absolutely right so, you know when we had to think about you know swatantra party gets 44 seats in the lok sabha in 1967 which is more than the other party part of that is because the way in which you stitch together the coalition involves a certain kind of heterogeneity right it involves people from formerly zamindar areas who continue to have you know unbelievably unequal uh, land relations right but that's not the whole story right and the, unfortunately that has been the characterization of the swatantra party in our social scientific literature which is that is a party of reaction of zamindar maharajas etc but to you would in that perspective is to miss the other set of phenomena taking place which are what arish damodaran calls the the new capitalists and so i think it's broad tent but you do have some lowest common denominators and i think the defense of the right to property is one so you know coming to the right to property again this is one area where part of it is being fought on a political platform but a bulk of the work is being done by swatantra party members slash supporters through the courts right yeah. so yeah. that i think is another super interesting theme how is that split taking place is it just again an opportunistic question of these are battles better fought in court or is there some deeper strategizing going on within the party of what kinds of questions are constitutional versus what kinds of questions are political versus what kinds of questions questions are social yeah absolutely so i think that if we have to think about the three dimensions of opposition politics as i described them right one is the imagination of a conservative party as salutary to for and, and a two party system as salutary for the health of a democracy even if it has different kinds of ends right the second is about mobilizing and communicating people around economic ideas and part of their democratic politics right and the third is using the you know three branches of government to check the party of the dominant power in that sense it is all part of a coherent project and if you look at the different things that happen with respect to defending the right to property you have the bank nationalization case the privy purses case but you also have the creation of a fundamental rights front right you also have these massive signature campaigns against the 17th amendment which are not successful so you combine the popular mobilization with the court challenges right and i think that is significant and makes swatantra quite interesting in that respect you know in hindsight and again i don't want to draw too many links to present day in a way that distorts your main point but sometimes when i think about the swatantra party i almost feel like I think they got the idea of how conservative Indians are in the sense that a big part of the Swatantra Party conservatism is not necessarily that you know this kind of patriarchal system is good or caste is good but more that if you try to enforce something top down uh, and if you try to use state coercion and state instruments to change this you are not likely to get a good outcome right these things have to evolve bottom up in that sense they're also very gandhian right in the second part of the book there are some very interesting sort of almost you know you 
they're like tiny biographies of individuals that you've managed to bring out in a particular political context. So first, I wanted to talk to you about CR. This is, you know, C. Rajgopalachari, who is sort of this giant even before Swatantra Party politics begins. In fact, he's had this long career as a nationalist. He's been in the Congress Party. He's agitated in the South. He was governor general and so on. And then, of course, he eventually starts getting sidelined. And this is almost a post-retirement second coming of Rajaji, right? So in one sense, what is Rajaji's intellectual sort of journey and where does it converge with this Swatantra Party politics and where does it diverge? That would be my big picture question on Rajaji. Yeah, absolutely. So in the case of Raj Gopalachari, in a sense, there's no Swatantra Party without Raj Gopal. Yeah. Right? So and there was wasn't once he died, actually. <laughs> he kind yeah, of collapsed. Exactly. <laughs> right. So he is, he is somebody who from the very early stages of his career, even though he's not necessarily thinking about the economy as something that is separate from other domains of life, he's certainly thinking about administration and the capacity of the empowerment of the officers of the state to corrupt. Right. And he's also operating in a particular context in which the Madras presidency is being commercialized and recognizing that while that creates various kinds of opportunities, so he's not like Gandhi in that sense, in terms of his attitude to the accumulation of wealth. Uh, but he recognizes that people should be cautious about it. There's always a moral balance to this and that you know it can create certain kinds of morality. right? And he is somebody who is also invested in certain kinds of measures to mitigate the suffering of people in rural areas and to sort of in that fight state. But the really interesting, I and mean, again, somebody who never studies formal economics, right, doesn't happen, doesn't really even discuss economic discourse with until it's really, you know, economic, we are in the 1950s. But he's somebody who has a sense that the state and its officers have the power to corrupt. Right? And that skepticism remains with him throughout his life. And that is, I think, a very fair you know, concern that he, he has. And when he becomes the chief minister of Madras in 1952, he abolishes price controls, right? Because that's something that's unpopular. That is something that is essentially leading to hoarding or black market activity by traders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He is also somebody who is invested in this project of, of asking people, you know, what are the second order consequences behind your you know, dirigist approach, right? What kinds of perversions can it create? He's somebody who, like a good kind of accountant, is also interested in balancing budgets, right? And so this whole idea of a deficit, you can actually see as, in some sense, the extension of a family that owes more than its own, own right? Or owes more than it, you know, its cash flow uh, gives it every year, you know, so income, income uh, that comes in every year. And that then becomes a sort of writ large over the whole economy, a set of ideas. So not a Keynesian. Right? Do you yeah. know, even there, it's like, I mean, I understand the sort of the parallel that you're drawing, but he does seem to have quite concrete views on inflation, for instance, right? Like, and, and this is not a very rudimentary view. This is, you know, the moment you start spending beyond your means, you're going to go into inflation and the inflation is basically a tax on everyone. It tends to be more regressive because it affects the poor the most. And so there is some sophistication in his economic thinking or, I mean, even if it's not trained or am I reading too much into it? No, so I think that there is a certain internal logic to his critique of inflation, I would say that's something that he learns from Shanoi, right? Because Shanoi is giving him that kind of material. But then there are times when he'll then make a leap and say, and then this will lead to the bankruptcy of the state and we will all you know, collapse and you know, it's the next step to authoritarianism. And I think that is where it gets a more kind of political valence. Because, you know, India's rate of inflation at that time is increasing, as I mentioned in the book, certainly more than it was. But it's, you know, the, the way that sometimes he talks about it is as if we're kind of, you know, <laughs> hyper inflation and interwar, interwar in a Weimar Republic. Right? So, but, you know, is he uh, really that wrong? I, you know, when I saw the bits about like, oh, this is this crazy slippery slope and we're going to end at authoritarianism. I mean, a few years after his death, we do have crazy emergency 
kind of situation that emergency rhetoric very much goes with the commanding heights of economic control rhetoric in 66 we have a serious balance of payments crisis which is another way of saying bankrupt in 1990 we actually have a very severe balance of payments crisis in fact in 1991 we have to you know very similar to the raja ji analogies we have to actually pledge our gold send our gold in ships so that people can lend us money for short term cover so in a sense was he really that far off the mark i know when you say he made this leap but is one way of thinking that he was sort of prescient or is it just he was making a leap i think that it, i think it, it, in a sense it, if you identify the foreign exchange so there was certainly a a valence to what he is saying that resonates with uh, challenges that are taking place in the indian economy at that time right we're going on a flan holiday and this sort of thing but i think to read the emergency as something that is set because of the template of economic policy followed at that time i would be hesitant to make that to, to draw that conclusion from it i've actually argued that in a paper i'll send it to you not so much directly about the economic planning leading to emergency but that the way economic planning led to consistent amendments to the constitution which eventually weakened checks and balances sufficiently that they make room for something like the emergency sure. because no, no, remember that, that, you know yeah. the amendments to the election act you know protecting the prime minister's position from judicial review all these things are coming you know one part of it is directly in the ninth schedule which is a 1951 innovation for land reforms and other kinds of socialist policy but i sort of draw that line but that's a constitutional line that is drawn uh, you know not so much that you have one particular plan outcome of x amount of saving and tomorrow it'll get you the emergency that not the argument but i'll send that to you i'd be curious to know what you think no absolutely absolutely yeah no i love you uh the other character that you have is ranga right now ranga is actually i mean the similarity with raja ji is that he is gandhian he's sort of like this grassroots politician you know of course in andhra pradesh as opposed to tamil nadu that's an important distinction but the other difference is he's in some sense much more rooted i know he sides with the landed class and the ryotwari class you know in this instance but on the other hand raja ji is sort of very much the brahmanical elite in tamil nadu the fact that he has this you know larger following is uh, a bit bizarre in the sense it's unusual whereas ranga seems much more rooted to the landed politics and sort of the socio economic politics of his time is that a reasonable way to distinguish the two that the kinds of coalitions they are building are quite different the kind of project they are engaged in one is quite elite the other is quite grassroots is that a good way to think about the distinction between the two yeah i think that's i think that's broadly fair the only thing is that the grassroots from which ranga is operating i would say the rural i would say the rural land interest i wouldn't necessarily say that they are necessarily egalitarian in that part of what he is trying to do is to collapse the distinction between the owner and the cultivator because there is quite a hierarchy you know even within the rayatwari uh, land space right and the fact is that even within areas that are broadly rayatwari you have various types of you know, inam lands you have various kinds of special tenures all of that but there is a particular kind of political work that is doing right in terms of bringing people together and i think that is that is something that you know pays political dividends to him unlike rajgopal achari who never wins i think other than the salem municipal district uh, municipal council election i don't think he ever wins a popular election in his life rajgopal achari's ability to build political capital is based on one or well originally kind of a, a relationship to gandhi and the ability to bring the congress now behind gandhi from the mufassil areas but then later on because of his extraordinary presence in the print sphere right i mean a figure who is based in marginalized multiple times kind of cast off into oblivion is being canonized by kalki which has a circulation of 100000 is irandal the socrata second socrates right all of his economic ideas are being translated into tamil every birthday of his there is a kind of a geographical set of articles written about him 
right? In Swaraja, he's writing in a magazine across India that circulates across India for about 16,000 people, right? And his translations of the Ramayana Mahabharata are phenomenal bestsellers. He's written 50, 60 other things as well. So he's somebody who uses the print to kind of amplify Whereas Ranga is somebody who is a, a member of parliament for over like 30, 40 years from one area where he has done extremely well in terms of, you know, getting the vote banks behind him. And also he's very invested in the earlier period, in the, the interwar period, in the Kisan Sabhas, right? And the Kisan Sabhas are crucial in terms of getting the masses behind Gandhian politics, both in you know, this whatever, uh, Northern Sarkar region, but across India. Yeah, and you know, Ranga also is a parliamentarian through and through, right? And there is this sense I get from Rajgopalachari's work and writing and sort of also his demeanor that he was sort of too cool for all of it, right? He's truly the elite and clearly not someone who is meant for canvassing door to door and, you know, standing for election and going to parliament and those sorts of things, right? So there seems to be that difference. The other thing I find fascinating, which you bring out in amazing detail in the book, is the coalition that he stitches together in you know, Madras, Tamil Nadu during that time, right? Both before and after the reorganization of the state. And they're sort of strange bedfellows, right? Like you don't think of someone like Rajaji and, you know, the DMK politicians as sort of allies. So one, how does this come about? Was it always fragile? You know, how much of it is to do with what we see mirrored today in the South, which is, you know, this sort of the, this linguistic subnationalism, you know, other kinds of subnationalism, which are quite unique to, you know, certain parts of the South versus something, you know, that was just a moment in that time that they all needed to form some kind of coalition against, you know, the large looming party, which was the Congress. Yeah, absolutely. The DMK, in a sense, it's, you know, mission and as an anti-caste is kind of Dravidian party, etc., it draws very much from the ideas and, and work of you know, Tandai Periyar, who is in many ways the anti-Rajaji, right? although they're in a very close personal equation. But there are sort of three things on which ideologically they come together, despite one being a, a left party and one not being a left party. Right? One is this issue of Hindi. So you mentioned the subnationalism, right? By 1965, Raj Gopalachari has changed his views, um, whereas in the 30s, he had you know, implemented the Gandhian agenda of learning Hindi. Um, and this is something that if you go back to the origins of free economy, right, free economy discourse in the Libertarian Social Institute, which is where I start my book, um, it's about English as the lingua franca for India rather than Hindi. Right? So it's non-Hindi, right? So that's one thing. The second thing is a mutual interest in decentralization of uh, economic policy, right? So things are not directed from Delhi. The states are strong. Uh, in terms of determining the federal allocation of resources and that sort of thing, right? And the third thing is inflation, right? The 1965 anti-inflation, Vilavasi Poratam uh, protests, etc., are very influential. And you actually can see that the the DMK sympathetic newspaper, Tandi, right, uh, publishes stuff like even if you have a 2% increase in inflation, it says that, you know, prices are riding in a really fast, you know, rapid way. One of them says, you know, so in other words, the uh, poison-like increase in, in prices, you know, and, and taxes and this sort of thing. So there is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, similarity on both left and right, right, about inflation and what it does to people. And that's something that they can come together on. And that, you know, even very senior you know, historians of the Dravidian movement will say that was very crucial in unseating the uh, in unseating the Congress in 1967. It's not merely a story of not to take away from the Dravidian ideology, but this is not merely a story of that. Yeah. No, I want to get into the Dinat and the archives later, but just because... I love the phrasing of all of it, right? They take something boring like inflation, they just turn it into something completely different. So I want to get to that in a minute. But the other figure that I want to discuss, we haven't gotten much into the Bombay, you know, group of the Swatantra Party. Now, this has always been a slightly different kind of group. You know, one, they're a lot more plugged into sort of global capital and also global literature, right? So the 
libertarian library that you talk about that you begin the book with that is very much in bombay that's where people are writing and exchanging notes with you know people in uh, libertarians abroad institute of economic affairs the freeman trying to pull this literature together you know in a more global sense and with english as the lingua franca but also that is where you get this coalition of businessmen who are not necessarily cronyist you know or against a particular kind of cronyism to chip into the swatantra party movement you know give speeches have you know space for things like forum of free enterprise have space for nani palki wala giving his famous lectures you know on the budget that was of course many years after the swatantra party movement but the bombay swatantra party yes yeah but it goes yeah, yeah. on so, so that, much yeah. longer than yeah, you know after course, the swatantra party yeah, yeah. but for me the bombay swatantra party cohort is quite different from the people in the south that we discussed so first i want to pick your brain on what you thought were the differences you know there's some very obvious cosmetic differences you know including you know a lot of the parsi influence a lot of the business influence but you know i'll let you answer first and then we can maybe peel the layers from that yeah absolutely i think the interesting thing is that the traditionally when you hear the bombay story of swatantra party it is around the tata right and it's around big business but what i was able to find was that it's not necessarily just that it's also people who are you know gujarati flower mill owner who's kind of minor right it is people who are in trading occupations and if you look at the membership of the forum of free enterprise right? it's not just your lal bhais or your you know tata directors or whatever you know it's somebody who runs a Uh, you know whatever an underwear shop in kolaba right so these are these are the kinds of people that are coming together and they are dealing with you know the problems with uh, you know elite bureaucracy and you know, questions of uh, foreign exchange problems in the in the plant prohibition economy. that's a so big that, one prohibition absolutely absolutely prohibition is a big thing you know this is a group of people that are coming together and the other kind of point is that this big business is in in a, in a way you know continues to support the congress right so the idea that swatantra is a big business party is one that is fairly disingenuous in that somebody like birla never disavows at all their support of the congress right even if the eastern economists are saying some you know, not very charitable things to them before he goes for a fiki meeting he asks nehru bjd birla what are the orders tatas are supporting the swatantra party for sure former director of tata ed shroff former public relations guy for the tata you know masani are very involved in the swatantra party although he has to you know dimit from his official role in the tata when he gets that position but at the same time tata say look they ask meru for permission first if you yeah, go ahead and donate to opposition parties and secondly they end up donating more money to the congress because you don't want to ruin your relationship with the dominant party that getting you permanence and as the malanobis committee finds out in 1964 the permits and licenses are disproportionately going to the big business houses what you have in the bombay swatantra party is short there are some people who are aligned or whatever you also have your kind of Traders, you know, maybe regional notable, uh, so not yeah, regional notables or city notables who are involved in this movement as well, and they cut across both the anglicized Parsi kind of community, but also you start to have you do have certain elements who are you know, maybe bilingual vernacular traders as well. Yeah, somehow to me, and maybe I'm imagining this, the Bombay. side of the swatantra party always seemed much more cosmopolitan and less conservative than the southern parts of the swatantra party how much of this is true or is this just my imagination of reading like you know palki wala and shroff and masani and actually the rest of the people who were part of the swatantra party were really marwadi and gujarati traders and flower mill owners and they were about as conservative as you know the landed gentry in you know andhra pradesh or somewhere else so what is a good way to think about that yeah absolutely so i think the boards and all that they get in bombay are really very limited right and if you look at the membership roles from bombay you see that it is actually heavily you know a parsi or anglicized professionals and this sort of thing you know lawyers that kind of thing who are not necessarily parsi but maybe kind of you upaka you whereas you know it's a figure like lotwala as a kind of rancho das lotwala who founds the libertarian social institute who comes from a lohana caste he happens to go operate in bilingual world i think that the membership mainframe membership is this anglicized kind of group 
And those people are, I think, would fit your definition in some way of classical liberal in that a figure like Mino Masani is for the uniform civil code. He is broadly an individualist. He's not very religious at all. He believes in, you know, in his book, Our Growing Human Family, he compares the tariff-laden European states of the interwar period with the free trading America. So very evocative image. So I think that's a, that would be a fair thing to say. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that the sort of leadership as well. Yeah. Was there ever any conflict on the social side? Because on the political and the economic, I can see that all the different groups are sort of allied. But on the social side, the conservatism of the South is quite different from the Bombay group. Was this ever a source of tension? Did it ever come up in, you know, their exchanges and so on? Or meetings? So actually, even within Bombay, there is some tension, right? Because the other organization, organization leadership that is involved in the Sandra party is that of the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan via K. Munshi, right? And again, I would argue that K. Munshi has very little to do with the day-to-day running of the Sandra party. Yeah. Right? But he's an important but figure who's kind of looming large. Exactly. He's a vice president. And then in terms of the constituent assembly, he's very important as the author of the fundamental rights section, right? And he is somebody who runs some of these sessions on the welfare state and its problems. He brings certain kinds of uh, individualist literature. So there's a sort of question there. Where this becomes a tension is in terms of where do you form coalition in Bihar? Do we ally with the Janasang? Do we ally? So Uddham Singh Nagok, who is Akali, kind of Punjabi politician, is one of the first people to come behind the Sutantra party. And some, and I mentioned him kind of arriving at the inaugural convention a little bit after Raj Gopajan. Akalis are not going to ally with the Janasang in Punjab. So you do have these certain kinds of tensions that crop up, right? I mean, you put a Ramayana Mahabharata written by Raj Gopachari in the hands of a form of free enterprise Parsi, you can be pretty sure it's not going to be read. <laughs> so, and incidentally, Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan Press publishes those books, right? Exactly. Yeah, those are like the KM Munshi side of things that are publishing that. You have Sada Sivam who's publishing the sort of things in the South through Kalki and through, you know, those local presses and so on. It's such a fascinating story of how this coalition gets formed. Now, before we end, I'm very curious about sort of the range of materials, both in terms of language and in terms of the different outlets that you've tapped into for this book. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? Like, are you fluent in Tamil? Hindi, Gujarati? Did you use translators? How did you decide on this set of archives versus another and so on? Yeah, absolutely. In terms of languages, I don't uh, read or or speak Gujarati, but I did have a key source, which was the autobiography of Bailal Bhai Patel, who's one of the he is the key figure for the Gujarat Swatantra Party, and he is associated with the model educational town in 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 Gujarat that is complements these kind of private cooperative production of milk in you know, Anand Milk Union Limited, which is India's you know, largest dairy cooperative. The, the Hindi sources, I worked on my own. The Tamil sources, I kind of learned to read Tamil during the, the process of writing my PhD. Yeah, I read and write Tamil, although I, I speak Tamil natively. And of course, when there were more challenging things, I would you know get help from uh, either, you know, A.R. Vagila Chalapati, who is a, is a professor at Madras Institute of Development Studies, or from my father, and kind to get clarifications on various sorts of things. But yeah, I worked with those materials, and I think that was one of the more challenging and rewarding aspects of this process. The book uses various kinds of sources, right? On the one hand, I do use the conventional archival sources from private papers of the likes of Raj Gopal Achari, K. M. Munshi, etc. But I also delve quite deeply into print culture, both in English and in Indian languages, particularly Tamil, and use various kinds of fragments from other places, everything from a kind of gramophone recording to writer's video footage of the first Vatantra Party convention, etc., etc., and try to kind of suture them together. You know, one question I had to ask there was, when you are doing a political history where a big portion of it is about economic policy, are you worried about, you know, this sort of telephone game or Chinese whispers where everything gets diluted or, you know, the message or the ideas get diluted a little bit? I ask because, you know, recently on the 91 Project, we published a piece on how... When Indira Gandhi asked economists, you know, she consulted economists about the 1966 devaluation, she kind of didn't really understand the nuance difference between what K.N. Raj was telling her and what Jagdish Bhagwati was telling her. And some of that just got lost in translation. 
is that even more of a problem when you're reading things in dinatandi and so on because it's written in such a sort of exciting way it's written in you know publicity and to catch attention of people how do you deal with that when you're doing this kind of an academic project you know and you have to match what their original ideas are with what the print media is saying yeah so i think a couple of things so with respect to that Fundamentally, I'm not dealing with the K and Rajas and Jagdish Bhagwati, right? In terms of the historical subjects, right? Probably the only person who has formal economic training that I talk about really is B. R. Sena, right? Um, and you're not looking at his academic work; you're looking at his popular work. Exactly. That. Exactly. Exactly. I'm not looking at his 1932, 33 essays, and all of that stuff, right? So, the uh, having said that. even these political figures speak in different registers in something like a popular protest than they do in their private correspondence and so i try to draw a tension with that for example with rajgopal acharya i mentioned that he writes to lal bahadur shastri about a rural road building program right uh, and so there are certain things that you say when you are you know in 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 the field and there are certain things that you say when you're trying to have a kind of calm cool discussion and but what are the things i'm trying to say that we actually need to study those varieties of political idiom because very often the ways in which we have communicated right is not through something that's very crisply written like you know one of friedman's essays in positive economics right very often we are communicated through a column and very often that column is not written by a nobel laureate like paul krugman that co- co- column is written by a figure like let's say walter lippmann and who doesn't have very much of an understanding of the innards of of, of economic policy and then it is then perceived by somebody who is you know a very a very different context so part of what i have been trying to do is to understand right like, how does the game of telephone get played because in a manner of speaking that is the majority of the economic discourse that we see in our lives yeah no and i found that portion of the book like truly fascinating like when you start digging into these political speeches you even have you know some photographs of posters and ads and so on in the book and it it gets so interesting and even now i mean i'm fluent in tamil but i've forgotten how to read it my my grandparents taught me at some point and read you know zandu bam ads in kalki and anand vigran but it's all it's all gone now uh, so hopefully i'll pick it up someday like you have but when i listen to the tamil political discourse to me i could draw such clear parallels between what's the discourses now and what you describe in the book so there you know that regional language colloquialism how this is getting communicated is quite extraordinary the last question i had was there seems to be another thing that's looming large in the book which is the discussion about cronyist you know i've always argued that india went from crony socialism to crony capitalism and nothing in between uh the crony capitalism seems to be particularly bad now and many people have brought their attention to it you already spoke about things like you know election including hindenburg yes uh, <laughs> yes and yeah. and now yeah. i mean there's a the earlier version yeah. was license permit raj and campaign financing which you do talk about in the book now it is electoral bonds and you know what is happening with hindenburg and so on is this against uh, like just i'm just dragging too much into the present or is this a very large part of opposition politics in india that has kind of been the mainstay you know cronyism is truly the enemy just like inflation is truly the enemy it's not about capitalism it's not about socialism it's about sort of the unfairness of it all and and how someone else gets to control our everyday lives like that seems to be the overwhelming theme that connects the past and the present is that something you think about when you do a work like this yeah absolutely because i think that is a, a criticism that aswatantra can levy on the congress and that's something that a congress can level on or or whatever maybe not the congress with very much locus standi but that's something which 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 an opposition party could level against the bjp today right i do so i think that there is that level of consistency the question about this whole notion of the permit license raj right the permit license raj which we tend to associate today with that which is you know part of the planned economy that is a hindrance to business is actually in its original coinage a wider phenomenon uh, which is about the oligarchic coalition between big business the congress party politicians and and bureaucrats right and now it's clear to me that in a sense bureaucracy has been disempowered since 2014 right and so maybe the form of cronyism has changed 
right? But we certainly see that just as the permits were disproportionately accumulating to Talmia, Tata, etc., and those days, there may be a slightly different set of firms today. You may have Reliance, Adani, etc. Tata is probably still up there. But that is there. Whether or not the bureaucratic nexus part of it exists, I'm not for sure. I think it exists in some shape or form, just not the same people and the same ministry. So you know, today the enforcement directorate would be the would be the new version of that bureaucrat, as opposed to you know Udyog Bhavan or you know the people who were handing out the permits in the sixties. So maybe the specific bureaucrat has changed, but the nexus between big bureaucracy, big government, big business, I I think seems to be the the consistent thread. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking time to do this. Thank you so much, Shruti, and and you know, looking forward to being conversation with you. Yeah. Ideas of India is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Help us grow by giving us a rating and leaving a review. Follow us on Twitter at s rajagopalan and at ideas of India. Also check out our initiative commemorating 30 years of India's market reforms at the 1991project.com.